welcome everybody. It is good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us for the virtual launch of a handbook. That tells you the potential of this handbook for parliamentarians and their teams across the African continent. My name is Femi Oke. It is my pleasure to be your moderator today. I am going to do a little bit of business before we officially get started. And that business includes going to the bottom of your screen. You will see a little globe there. Our event today will be conducted in English and French. Should you need English translation, interpretation, or French trans interpretation, you will find that little globe at the bottom, select English or French, and then you will be able to hear the rest of this session in the language of your preference. Today, I am asking all of you, if you're not speaking, to mute your microphones. That will allow us to have a great conversation. But turn on your videos so that we can see each other, so that even in the virtual world, we know that we are amongst friends and colleagues and new friends and new colleagues. So please do that. There is a chat function at the very bottom of the screen, and that is there for you to be able to communicate with each other, have a bilateral conversations as well as a conversation that we are having here on screen and also that is a place to put your questions and your comments a little bit later on we will be taking your comments and your questions you'll be able to take the floor uh, which is always a very exciting event in a live webinar you never quite know what may well happen I, I'm going to give you a speed course on, on what to do before you suggest yourself to take the floor make sure your video is set. Make sure that we can see your face. Make sure your face is lit. Make sure that there isn't a lot of headroom and then your head is right at the bottom. Uh, make sure your, your, your microphone is ready to be turned on. So just be ready for that moment for when you take the floor so that I don't have to direct you to do that as we continue. So I am looking forward to your questions, your comments as we proceed with our program, but I am going to ask Richard Florizel from IISD, the CEO of IISD, to officially start our program. Richard, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, Femi, and apologies for my early start. I was just so excited to get going. Let me say again, um, I feel so humbled and honored to have this opportunity uh, to open this meeting on the role of parliamentarians in enhancing responsible investment, responsible investment in agriculture for the transition toward more sustainable food systems in Africa. And in particular, to launch uh, this great handbook today, Responsible Investments in Agriculture and Food Systems, a practical handbook, a practical handbook for parliamentarians and parliamentary advisors. Um, allow me to start by highlighting the problem. As the video summarized, we need not just more, but that better investment in agriculture and food systems. Um, an estimated nearly 700 million people were undernourished in 2019. And of course that has only gotten worse with the pandemic uh, where estimates are that that number could increase by 130 million in 2020. These figures are deeply concerning. And it's in fact, I would say, morally unacceptable to have persistent hunger and malnutrition in a world that produces enough food for all. For ISD, working towards ending hunger has been a major priority for us for many years. And we share the idea that investing in agriculture and rural development is essential to ensuring food security and empowering people to eradicate poverty. In fact, our latest research uh, at ISD together with Cornell uh, under something called the Series 2030 project revealed that if donor governments could double their aid, double their aid in the right kind of initiatives, we could actually end hunger. We could double the income of over half a billion small scale farmers and also meet the Paris 2030 goals. That spending would need to be accompanied by an extra 19 billion a year from low and middle income countries. But it shows that success is within our reach. And again, as the video said, we know that all investments are not equal, whether they're public or private. The wrong kind of investment, if done badly, can undermine local food security, it can violate land tenure rights, it can worsen conditions for marginalized groups, and it can deplete and degrade natural resources. So it's important to get the investment right. Responsible investment is needed to drive agricultural transformation. And that, that opportunity is especially important for small and uh, family farmers and to ensure that women, women who still suffer too much every day from violence and discrimination are given the rightful place. 
So we all recognize the need to invest more and to invest better with clear and shared objectives. And the principles in this handbook will enable us to do just that. So now the challenge is to implement these voluntary principles at the national and regional levels. I'm more than delighted to affirm today that the handbook is an invaluable tool for informing and inspiring parliamentarians on how to mainstream responsible agricultural investments into the public agenda, into the legislative process, into budgets and the oversight of policies. It's designed to help achieve this concrete and practical impact on the ground. It builds on more than 10 years of work with parliamentarians in Africa, and it's a handbook that is a critical contribution to advancing more responsible investment in agriculture, as well as showcasing some positive changes in laws and policies around the world. In closing, I wish to sincerely thank and recognize members of parliament who contributed to the handbook's development. Uh, and to thank them for their tireless work, the strength of their convictions and their commitment to be able to meet these collective challenges. The handbook has been developed by ISD and FAO with a critical involvement of members of parliament who participated in the drafting and its review. I'd like to pay tribute now to all parliamentarians and their advisors. As policymakers, you and they have the power to vitalize productivity, to bridge this inequality gap and drive the kinds of reforms that empower men and women in the agriculture and food systems. Today's launch is about sharing knowledge and defining actions. These are crucial elements to ensuring effective progress towards our commitment to ending hunger and poverty and achieving food and nutrition security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Participants, attendees, it's really nice to see you. I see more and more are coming and, and joining. Let me just remind you that at the bottom of your screen that you will be able to hear this launch, this virtual launch of the Parliamentarian Handbook uh, for African Parliamentarians and their teams. You'll be able to hear this in French and in English. If you click on that little globe there at the bottom of your screen. I also want you to be camera ready. In a moment, we are going to take a family photograph, all of us. So your videos will need to be on. You can keep mute, but your videos will need to be on. So stand by for that. But first, a baby. Ali Gabriel is the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa for FAO. It is good to see you. Welcome. Thank you, Femi. Honorable speakers and members of parliaments, Dr. Richard Florizone, President and CEO of International Institute for Sustainable Development, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, on behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this important launch event. Today's discussion on the role of parliamentarians in enhancing responsible investments for sustainable, inclusive, and resilient food systems is significant and relevant, particularly as the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of agri-food systems as well as livelihoods uh, in Africa. COVID-19 is an additional burden, as you know, to the food systems in Africa, uh, already by, uh, challenged by climate extremes, degradation of natural resources, protracted conflicts, transboundary pests and animal diseases, uh, and economic downturns. This is compounded by lack of sustainable investments to support transformation and change in priority areas uh, notably on resilience building in agriculture and food systems. I cannot overemphasize the fact that investment in agriculture and food systems is key for the achievement of economic growth, eradicating poverty and hunger, uh, namely SDG 1 and SDG 2, but more. However, it's paramount that investments should be responsible. We emphasize about responsible investment because we know that not all investments are necessarily responsible. Responsible investments should prioritize the achievement of food security and nutrition. It must uphold decent work and protect the most vulnerable. By doing so, responsible investments can create the conditions for more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient agri-food systems, and thus strategically support efforts to recover 
from shocks, as well as contribute towards preventing future crises. In this respect, the principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems adopted by the Committee on World Food Security in 2014 provide guidance to all stakeholders on what constitutes a responsible investment. As you are aware, these principles are voluntary and non-binding. They require translation and domestication into national frameworks for them to be useful in influencing policies, investments, and concrete actions. The role of parliaments in this regard is significant, both at national, sub-regional, and regional levels. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes the essential role of national parliaments through their enactment of legislation and adoption of budgets and their role in ensuring accountability for the effective implementation of commitments. Parliamentarians can promote the enhancement of public responsible investments into the agriculture sector in accordance with national and regional agriculture investment plans in the framework of the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, CADEP, and the Malabo Declaration, for instance, for the provision of public goods and services, including infrastructure, energy, research and development, especially in rural areas. They can also contribute towards putting in place the enabling environment and conducive investment climate to increase private responsible investments, supporting smallholders, youth-led and women-led small and medium enterprises on one side and attracting larger scale agribusiness investments while ensuring well-defined safeguards are in place to protect human rights and prevent damages to the environment. Currently, FAO works with more than 40 national, sub-regional and regional parliamentary alliances worldwide, promoting political dialogue and contributing capacity development. So far, more than 30 laws have been developed and adopted thanks to this collaboration. In 2016, the Pan-African Parliament established the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition through a memorandum of understanding with FAO. Within this framework, technical cooperation has been provided to parliamentarians in Africa, strengthening their capacities on a number of priority themes, including gender and social policies, sustainable food systems, healthy diets, access to natural resources, and other topics. FAO is supporting the Pan-African Parliament towards developing a model law on food security and nutrition. The purpose of the model law is to assist countries that aim to develop national or sub subnational legislation on the right to adequate food and food security and nutrition. Countries may make use of the model law in elaborating a framework legislation, primary legislation or secondary legislation that covers all or some aspects of food security and nutrition. Several training activities were developed at some regional level in Eastern Africa, in Central Africa, and Western Africa, uh, at the national level, in several countries in Cameroon, the Republic of Congo, Gabon, Madagascar, Sao Tome and Principe, Sierra Leone, and Uganda, for example. National parliamentary alliances have been formed in several countries. In 2018, at the Global Parliamentary Summits Against Hunger and Malnutrition, that was held in Madrid, Spain. A declaration highlighting the need to create an enabling environment for responsible investment in food systems was adopted through consensus by many parliamentarians from different regions. Subsequently, in 2019, FAO joined forces with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, to develop a practical handbook which aims at supporting parliamentarians in the creation of enabling environments in the range of areas related to investment in agriculture and food systems. It's gratifying that we are gathered today to officially launch the practical handbook. This is part of a series of events. Last week, it was launched with the European Parliamentary Alliance Against Hunger, and in early 2021, it will be launched with the Latin American Parliament. At FAO, we reiterate our commitment to continue working with all of you on this strategic topic. 
I look forward to today's discussion. I'm very grateful to have such distinguished speakers with us. I would like to thank all the honorable members of regional and national parliaments that will be sharing their valuable time with us, as well as the president and CEO of the ISD, Dr. Richard Florizone, and all the experts that are joining. I thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Abebe, Ali, Gabriel, and also Richard Florizone for your opening remarks. There is a point where it is great at every gathering where we can put our cameras on and, and just gather together. So I am going to ask you, everybody, <laughs> this is gonna be a little bit tricky, keep your microphones off, but we are going to pose for a family photograph for our event launch of the handbook. Are you ready? Are you ready for your virtual close-up? Uh, I, I see, <laughs> I see a close-up of Ali, Ali, uh, Gabriel. So we need to all of us be there. So I'm going to see if we can make a, a gallery view so we can see everybody, which would be fantastic. And then I'm going to count down into five, four, three, two, one. Uh, virtual event host, are you ready so that everybody can pose for their pictures? All right, stand by. So this is our family photograph. Strike a pose. Excellent. I feel the community amongst us. Excellent. We are going to have a number of different sessions today. They're very fast, they're very speedy. But the point of this is to take us through uh, connecting the, the usefulness of the handbook to what parliamentarians are doing, to agriculture, to a lot of different themes that all bring us back to SDG2. Uh, to getting rid of hunger globally by 2030. It's always been an audacious, audacious ask. Uh, so our very first session is about the role of parliamentarians in getting to that 2030 goal. I, I cannot necessarily guarantee that you can go to the ECOWAS Parliament, but I can bring the Speaker of the ECOWAS Parliament to you. Honourable Sidi Mohamed Tunis at the ECOWAS Parliament. It is really good to have you here. When we're looking at uh, small scale farmers and the issues they have uh, in the ECOWAS region uh, and, and what investing in social protection might be able to do for them, how would you set the scene for us? What would you talk to us about? Honourable Mohamed Tunis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Thank you, everyone. I want to first of all acknowledge and appreciate the organizers for the timely launch of the handbook for parliamentarians on responsible investment in our in our food system. This is a time security and nutrition in the sub-region with almost or more than 50 million of our compatriots hungry at this stage. Responsible investment in agriculture, therefore, is critical to sustainable development as a disease, poverty, and food security, contributes to rural development and opportunities for job creation. And in investing in agriculture and food systems, especially in the ECOWAS region, where agriculture is a backbone of the economy and majority of the smallholder farmers produce food for their nations priorities should focus on food security and nutrition. But while acknowledging the development of the principles of responsible investment in agriculture and food systems framework, there is no automatic guarantee that it will translate into positive outcomes without its domestication into the national law by parliamentarians, who will also ensure Budget and oversight are provided for its effective implementation and monitoring. That the ECOWAS Parliament has taken a bold step, concrete and practical steps to not only popularize the principle to its member states, but also operationalize the provisions in the principles as follows. The establishment in December 2018. Uh, the ECOWAS network of parliamentarians on gender equality and investment in agriculture with the aim of building capacity in advocating for gender equitable agricultural investment is just one way we believe ECOWAS parliament is ready to support the process. I also 
uh, want to inform honorable members present here and our distinguished panelists that in the ECOWAS Parliament, we have a policy of ensuring that we hold some of our committee meetings outside of the headquarters of ECOWAS Parliament. With that way, we are able to bring Parliament, ECOWAS Parliament to the people, and we are also able to support them. Such meetings that we refer to normally as the delocalized meetings. Recent one was held in Bissau, in Guinea-Bissau, where we look at the impact of COVID-19 on food production and food insecurity. In that meeting, we were able for five good days, able to interact with resource persons from West Africa Health Organization, from FAO, from the Ministry of Health and Agriculture in Bissau, and also the agricultural people from the ECOWAS Commission. We deliberated on all of these issues and we were able to bring the whole system itself to the people of Guinea-Bissau. And we believe in the ECOWAS Parliament that this is one way we think we can work towards food, set food sufficiency in the sub region. But again, there are challenges, a, a whole lot of challenges. If we are looking at really ensuring that uh, there are policies and framework enhancing agriculture and food systems work, then the parliamentarians themselves have to, first of all, be uh, empowered to do so. FAO has been very, very helpful. FAO has supported parliamentarians across the board to host a series of workshops. One happened in Freetown not too long ago. But again, most of the ECOWAS states have not met the 10% national budget committed threshold to agriculture. We have had a series of problems in ECOWAS countries with budget for oversight work. We have also had high attrition rates in parliament, wiping out most of the institutional memories at every election. We have had situations like even in Sierra Leone parliament, where we had members of parliament who were trained, like uh, the FAO representative was saying, one of the uh, MPs who actually represented us in that because of the high number of problems we are having with uh, parliament, parliamentarians are having. But again, the launching of the book itself is great for us because. Honorable City Mohamed Chines, uh, it. it it's uh, MPs, really difficult for me. Most, we have been able at last appointment. Honorable City Mohammed, it is difficult to hear you. We are hearing fewer and fewer words from you, which is really? unfortunate because of the connection. Uh, but we see your confidence. I am going to ask you to wrap up because I yeah, do exactly. not feel was, the internet will was, stay was, with us long was, enough to hear your, your concluding point. So let's speed it up. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just you, bring it home, bring it home, wrap it up. Can you hear me? I hear you, I hear you, that but we are losing connectivity. Go, that, go that ahead. Very, very good. So for us as parliamentarians, the launching today is a fantastic idea. It's a great opportunity for us. We are going to use this handbook as a tool to support our farmers. We are going to use it to mobilize resources for our farmers. We are going to use it to ensure that there is full self security for our farmers and our people in the, in the sub region. Again, I want to thank you, and I'm so sorry for the internet. I'm so sorry, but I'm hoping that as we go along, we'll be able to explain more of the challenges that I was trying to bring up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. It just got in that very strong end in there. Really appreciate you. Thank you very much. We continue with the role of parliamentarians in achieving the 2030 agenda, especially SDG 2. It is my pleasure to bring in His Excellency Honorable Abdelhamid Suriri. He is the Vice Chairman of the Chamber of Councillors in the Kingdom of Morocco and also many other titles. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Honorable Adhamid Suriri, in the context of this conversation, will you tell us your other titles as well? Welcome, go ahead. And then I want to ask you about the role of your association in promoting a transition to more sustainable food systems. Good to see you, good to hear you. Bonjour à tous. Monsieur le Président, les institutions parlementaires, Messieurs les représentants de l'Institut international de développement durable et de l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour l'alimentation et l'agriculture, messieurs les experts, mesdames et messieurs, 
Permettez-moi tout d'abord de vous exprimer mon plus vif remerciement et notre profonde estime envers l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour l'augmentation de l'agriculture, l'Institut international de développement durable et les unions parlementaires et gérées continentales en Afrique, pour, le, pour leurs efforts continus visant à apporter des réponses adéquates aux défis auxquels font face nos pays, en particulier ceux liés à la sécurité alimentaire et à la nutrition. Je suis très heureux de prendre part à cette importante réunion qui va sans doute contribuer à élever le niveau de vigilance, de suivi et de mobilisation et de trouver des initiatives pour faire face aux défis en jeu auxquels le continent africain est confronté. Mesdames et messieurs, notre rencontre d'aujourd'hui se déroule dans des circonstances régionales et internationales difficiles et exceptionnelles en raison des conséquences et des répercussions de la pandémie de COVID-19 sur les plans économiques, social et humain. Selon les études et les rapports publiés par les organes et organismes internationaux compétents, le monde devrait connaître la pire récession économique du siècle en cours. Alors que l'économie mondiale est sur le point de connaître une croissance négative d'environ 5%, avec une dette publique mondiale également atteignant des niveaux records et sans précédent. En raison de toutes ces considérations, la pauvreté mondiale devrait augmenter de 150 millions de personnes cette année, dont 8 sur 10 en partie des États du Sud. Ces indicateurs révèlent incontestablement l'ampleur des défis sans précédent à relever dans le cadre de l'agenda économique et social mondial, notamment en ce qui concerne les mécanismes de relance, la revitalisation économique et le renforcement des investissements, en particulier ceux liés à l'amélioration des systèmes alimentaires. Mesdames et messieurs, situation et ses défis sans précédent et croissants imposent plus que jamais la nécessité d'intensifier les efforts pour établir un cadre africain en tant que mécanisme de coopération, de solidarité et de collaboration entre tous les pays du continent et la promotion d'une action commune entre les gouvernements, le Parlement, le secteur privé et les organisations internationales dans le cadre d'un système d'efforts harmonieux et coordonné pour progresser vers des systèmes alimentaires plus durables en Afrique, assurant ainsi la sécurité alimentaire en tant qu'apport stratégique et essentiel pour faire face aux conséquences de la pandémie du Covid-19 et à la vulnérabilité croissante qui en résulte surtout au niveau, au niveau des pays du continent. À cet égard, nous considérons notre pays, le Royaume du Maroc, que le moyen le plus efficace pour relever ces défis s'incarne principalement dans l'action commune, la coopération et la solidarité entre les pays africains. Dans ce contexte, nous voudrions renouveler notre profonde reconnaissance pour l'initiative royale de Sa Majesté le Roi Mohamed VI visant à établir le cadre opérationnel pour accompagner les pays africains dans leurs différentes phases de gestion de la pandémie. Il s'agit d'une initiative pragmatique et orientée vers l'action, permettant un partage d'expériences et de bonnes pratiques pour faire face à l'impact sanitaire, économique et social de la pandémie. Cette initiative reflète sans aucun doute la philosophie de Sa Majesté et son engagement ferme en faveur d'une approche solidaire vers les pays africains, avec les pays africains. Mesdames et messieurs, ces défis croissants soulèvent pour nous, parlementaires, que ce soit au niveau des parlements nationaux ou sur le plan régional, ou à travers des réseaux parlementaires sur la sécurité parlementaire, des responsabilités et des rôles qui sont sans aucun doute essentiels, car les parlementaires sont des partenaires clés dans les politiques liées à l'investissement agricole et aux systèmes alimentaires, et jouent des rôles et des fonctions législatives et de contrôle liés à l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable. Les parlementaires jouent également un rôle central dans le processus d'adoption des lois visant à pouvoir promouvoir l'investissement public et privé dans le secteur agricole, en particulier les petites et moyennes entreprises. Je ne voudrais pas manquer cette occasion sans citer les efforts de la Chambre des conseillers et de l'association des Sénats, Choura, les conseils équivalents d'Afrique et du monde arabe, visant à relever les défis de la sécurité alimentaire en Afrique et dans le monde arabe. Des efforts qui ont abouti à la création du réseau parlementaire pour la sécurité alimentaire en Afrique et dans le monde arabe à l'occasion du Forum économique parlementaire arabo-africain tenu au siège de la Chambre des conseillers en 2018 en partenariat avec la Confédération générale des entreprises du Maroc 
et l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour l'alimentation et la culture, FAO. Le réseau a tenu sa première réunion en mars du séminaire sur le, sous le thème « Parlement, le défi de la sécurité alimentaire » organisé par la Chambre des conseillers en janvier 2019, où la charte fondatrice du réseau a été approuvée. Le bureau exécutif du réseau a tenu une autre réunion en juin 2020 par visioconférence pour étudier l'impact de la pandémie du COVID-19 sur la sécurité parlementaire dans les régions africaines et arabes. Une réunion qui a été couronnée par une déclaration contenant des recommandations importantes, dont je cite l'appel à organiser un forum international pour contribuer à l'effort interparlementaire visant à atteindre l'objectif commun de la création d'une coalition parlementaire mondiale pour éliminer la faim et la malnutrition dans le cadre d'un système alimentaire durable ainsi que le renforcement de la coopération avec, avec la FAO pour contribuer à atténuer l'impact du COVID-19 sur la sécurité alimentaire et prendre des mesures proactives pour réduire les répercussions sur l'économie, le commerce alimentaire, les chaînes d'approvisionnement et les marchés grâce à une logique efficace. Mesdames et Messieurs, je, vous, je suis convaincu que cette réunion aboutira à un certain nombre de recommandations et de décisions importantes qui favoriseront des investissements responsables dans l'agriculture et les systèmes alimentaires visant à promouvoir la sécurité alimentaire dans les pays africains. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Abdul Hamid Suriri. We appreciate your comments and your contribution to our virtual event today. If you would like to take the floor, if you have questions for any of our speakers, very easy to do. You can jump into the chat, you can make that very well known, and we will come back to you a little bit later in the program. But do say, I have a question, I would like to ask this of the speakers, and then we will know that you would like to be part of our program. So the Interparliamentary Union has worked extensively across the world in engaging parliaments to help them achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Ms. Alexandra Blagrevec is the program manager for the International Development, uh, Manager for the International Development, or the I IPU. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this program. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great pleasure and indeed a, a great honor to speak in this uh, distinguished panel this morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I bring you greetings from the IPU Secretary General, uh, Mr. Martin Chungog, who could unfortunately not be here with us today. Um, the I IPU, as many of you know, is the Global Organization of Parliaments. Our members expressed their commitment to the SDGs even before their official adoption by the United Nations. In the declaration that they adopted during the IPU assembly in Hanoi in April 2015, our member parliaments under underlined the key responsibilities that they have in terms of legislation, oversight, representation, and budget in support of the SDGs. What is important to highlight really is that SDGs tell us where we want to be, but they don't tell us how to get there. For more than five years now, the IPU has been supporting Parliament in integrating the SDGs into their work. Our main vehicle for action has been the SDG self-assessment toolkit, which has helped many Parliaments in Africa and the world to develop a strategy to institutionalize the SDGs and reflect them in their work. As the Chad formed a standing committee on the SDGs, the Parliament of Sierra Leone organized trainings with parliamentary committees in order to streamline their SDG engagement and so on. The IP also promotes exchanges of good practices and experiences among parliamentarians. Since 2015, we have organized more than 20 regional and interregional seminars in all regions of the world bringing together more than a thousand members of parliament from 134 countries. Through these seminars, the IP observed openness uh, and engagement from various parliaments and even in regions marked with a political tension 
We use the SDGs as a platform for dialogue and driver of innovation for economic growth. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has interrupted many things, including the work of Parliament. As soon as the pandemic broke out, the IPU started collecting information from Parliament about how they organize, for example, what technologies they use to meet, how committees meet, how the parliamentary agenda is organized, and so on. This information is available through a database on parliaments in a time of pandemic, which is available on our website. In terms of the SDGs, not surprisingly, uh, there has been a setback. This setback is not witnessed in the lack of political will, rather it is more about adapting to the new circumstances and recognizing recognizing more clearly the link recovery actions. This is the area where the IPU is currently putting a lot of effort, assisting parliaments in using the SDG goals and targets as a guiding principle in their recovery um, effort. In our view, this is the only way that the world, for the world to truly build back better. Allow me to, to conclude by sharing with you some insights from a regional UN Economic Commission for Africa. During this event, it was highlighted that Africa is on track to achieve only nine out of 169 SDG targets by 2030. The event identified the COVID-19 pans of Africa's vulnerability and recommended that African countries should pay special attention to the way they channel their stimulus, as this will shape the quality of the recovery. By prioritizing a green economy pathway, resilient energy and infrastructure, climate smart food production, nature based solutions, Africa could respond quickly and build long term resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to focus our attention on gender equality, female empowerment, and the investment in women in agriculture across the African continent, and also just acknowledge how many women are in agriculture across the African continent as well. Honorable Olomato Driro from Senegal uh, is part of ECOWAS. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Will you tell us what you do in ECOWAS and then how you're going to get us started as we look at gender equality and female empowerment? Welcome, it's good to have you. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, tout d'abord, uh, je voudrais uh, saluer tout le monde et remercier les partenaires ici présents et l'ensemble des parlementaires ici présents. Je vais citer le président Timis qui est le président du Parlement de la CD, qui a pendant deux ans le Parlement. Euh, en tant que parlementaire, au niveau du Sénégal, euh, je disais que c'est une opportunité pour moi de partager cette auguste assemblée où l'on parle des problèmes des femmes allant dans l'agriculture. Avant d'être parlementaire, j'ai été femme de développement. Jusqu'à présent, je suis femme de développement. Je suis présidente d'une association à 90% femmes. Et toutes ces femmes s'activent dans l'agroalimentaire pour régler le problème de la sécurité alimentaire. Donc, je pense que je peux apporter une petite contribution. Euh, donc, ma participation avec ces femmes m'a permis de savoir leurs problèmes depuis... 1994, après la dévaluation du franc CFA, euh, les femmes ne cessent de booster, d'essayer de booster leurs activités. Euh, sachant que les femmes n'ont pas de moyens, mais malgré leurs maigres moyens, elles se sont toujours positionnées au devant de la scène. Donc aujourd'hui, si j'arrive à accéder au Parlement, je pense que mon rôle, c'est de porter le plaidoyer. Et depuis que je suis rentrée dans ce Parlement, je ne cesse d'en parler. Donc, je disais qu'aujourd'hui, le rôle est de porter leur plaidoyer au niveau de nos parlements respectifs. Nous n'avons pas le droit 
de faire échec. C'est ça qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons toutes les ressources qui peuvent nous permettre aujourd'hui de régler le problème de l'agriculture. Pourquoi je le dis Je dis que l'Afrique n'est pas pauvre. L'Afrique n'est pas pauvre, mais c'est la façon dont nous discutons avec nos partenaires stratégiques. Quand je parle de nos partenaires stratégiques, je veux dire nos alliances européennes, nos, nos, nos policiers européennes, nos alliances parlementaires. Euh, donc, euh, toutes ces conventions que nous devons citer doivent aller dans le sens d'essayer de, de régler les problèmes de l'agriculture. Et nous en avons beaucoup, nous pouvons en citer. Nous avons la, le problème de l'organisation des réseaux. Nous avons les problèmes de la formation. Nous avons les problèmes de la technologie. Nous avons les problèmes de l'eau. Nous avons les problèmes de la de, 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 du transfert euh, technologique. Donc, je pense que si on arrive à régler ces, tous ces problèmes et qu'on arrive à organiser les réseaux, je pense que nous pouvons atteindre notre objectif. Et moi, je disais que nous avons fait des visites au niveau du pays. Nous avons visité le groupe de 100 personnes, les 97 étaient des femmes. Et ces types de programmes méritent d'être multipliés dans les pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Ce sont des femmes, les 97 étaient des femmes, et ils s'activaient, elles s'activaient dans la production du café. Nous avons vu les propres composts et ce type de programme nous a permis d'atteindre l'objectif. Donc moi, quand j'ai vu ce programme, quand je suis rentré chez moi, je ne cesse d'en parler. Donc je pense que aujourd'hui, en tant que parlementaire, c'est vrai, nous faisons tout pour pousser, pousser nos gouvernements à, à régler le problème du secteur de l'agriculture, qui est aujourd'hui un secteur de lutte contre la pauvreté et de régler le problème de la malnutrition. Mais aussi, en tant que parlementaire, il serait opportun avec la société civile d'essayer de trouver des, parlements, des, 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 des partenaires stratégiques qui peuvent nous accompagner pour qu'on puisse montrer aujourd'hui que c'est possible. Donc, euh, moi, ce que j'ai vu en tout cas en Kigali, ça m'a motivé et je ne cesse d'en parler. Donc, euh, je ne vais pas être longue. Je pense que cette pandémie nous a appris beaucoup de choses. Donc, nous devons aller autour du, des vues. Et aller autour des vues, c'est de sortir les recherches qui sont dans les trois, essayer de les vulgariser, donner l'opportunité aux femmes, aux jeunes de pouvoir aujourd'hui booster le, 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 le problème de, de l'agriculture. Donc, euh, je m'en arrête là et vous féliciter. Donc, euh, ça m'a pris un coup de pour me dire que il y a une collègue qui devait présenter. Donc, euh, malheureusement, elle a eu un empêchement. Donc, je me suis porté volontaire pour parler au nom des femmes. Donc, les femmes sont les... Comme on le dit, comme on, le dit on dit que les femmes sont les... Euh, Aujourd'hui, les femmes sont prêtes à augmenter le PIB de leur pays. Et nous en savons quelque chose. Donc, nous sommes prêts. Il faut donner à Dieu ce qui appartient à Dieu. Et donner à César ce qui appartient à César. Donc, je dis vive les femmes. Merci à nos partenaires stratégiques et bonne continuation. Thank you very much. Olimato Driro from Senegal uh, speaking from ECOWAS about the work of gender equality and how it is so important in investing in women. When we think about gender equality in parliaments, not just on the African continent, but around the world, Rwanda is ahead unbelievable in terms of female empowerment, gender equality, uh, honorable members who are women. So it, it is to Rwanda that we go via the honorable Rukana Albert. He's a member of the Chamber of Deputies in Rwanda. So uh, we, we are going to ask you for, for your advice about some of the challenges that Rwanda has faced uh, in terms of linking, strengthening the food systems, fighting hunger and malnutrition, improving livelihoods of rural populations, 
and also supporting women to do all of that. It seems like a heavy lift, but Rwanda is well situated to do it. You already understand female empowerment. Welcome to the floor. Good to have you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here in this important event. I'm uh, Albert Ruhakana, member of parliament in the standing committee of uh, land, agriculture, livestock, and the environment. I'm here on behalf of uh, light honorable speaker of Rwandan parliament who conveyed me her message and do apologize for not being here in this event because of a conflicting agenda. So, as you, you said, the Rwanda is progressing in the gender equality, as you said. And the topic of promoting gender, gender equality and human empowerment in the agriculture investment is, it is extra recovery linked to strengthening food system, fighting hunger, malnutrition, and improving livelihood of rural population. You ask what a challenge, of course, even you are ahead, we meet uh, many challenges, and you have even the opportunity to overcome this challenge and give, as you ask, three. three concrete case. So woman empowerment in agriculture is crucial form, is crucial for, for women on at national and in the social economy development is there for a core component in the most intervention area. It's linked to too many positive spillover effect on the overall economy, households, members' health, food security, national status, and the detection of gender-based violence and the discrimination. So from <coughs> issue of uh, gender quality in Rwanda, it starts by gov governance. It is says, to set from 1995, after Beijing Treaty, they said the, gov the governance system having to strengthen the gender equality. And uh, in agriculture, we have the strategy. The strategy for transformation agriculture take account gender equality as one of the pillar in cross-cutting program. So Rwanda has strategic for development transformation since 2020, 2000, 2020 vision 2020. We have national strategy for transformation NST1, which started 2018 for seven years government program, they are put the pillars of gender sensitive and gender equality. So in agriculture, how the gender equality is involved in, in empowering women in agriculture investment. So we have the strategic plan for agriculture transformation in Rwanda. Now we have PSTR called the PSTR. PSTR 1, PSTR 2, 3, and 4. Now we are heading at 4, which is started in 2005. It is five years strategy. Where there is the woman. From this strategic plan for, for transformation agriculture, we had put in place woman empowerment in, in investment. As a member of parliament, we have set the under the law which dealing with uh, with woman empowerment in agriculture and the woman empowerment in the civil sector of Rwanda government. 
as parliamentarian, we have enacted many, many laws saying on agriculture. I can give an example, the, the organic law number 1213, stating the gender, you see, gender responsive budget, where we enforce accountability measures for gender sensitive allocation across program, programs and projects through gender budget statement. All program, when we enact the budget, the fiscal year budget, we have to look where the gender, gender equality, is, the budget is allocated there. We have the law number 43, 2013 of 16 June 2013, governing land in Rwanda, where Galanti equal right for men and women access to land 50-50. We have even the prevention, the law number 59, 2008 of 10 September 2008 on prevention and the punishment of gender-based violence and the discrimination. We have also the law number 51, 2007 of 20 September 2007, determining the responsibility, organization, and the functioning of gender monitoring office, which called GMO, is an executive organ operating under Minister of Primary Minister Office, dealing with execution of a quality of gender regulation, the gender based violence prevention, and so on. We have the Ministry of Gender and the Family Promotion, which is follow making the policy and the evaluate, monitoring the evaluation of the gender equality. In the Parliament, we have a forum of women parliamentarian called the FFLP. It is dealing to see to, to do advocacy in all organs of, the, of uh, the country, especially in the agriculture where 70% are women. By conclusion, I can say that now, the, the agriculture sector in Rwanda is contributing to 33 digital GDP. We've increased since 2014 at 70%, where women are playing important role. It can say now, it has said now that we are in PSTF4. This PSTF4 engages the woman in capacity enhancement, building capacity of women, building her knowledge, access to finance market, and dealing with uh, access to, to have, to work with agriculture, big projects, funded like a World Bank project, if that, USID and so on. So by conclusion, there is a challenges, challenges we, we could meet on gender, of course. We may have some challenges dealing with the illiteracy in a woman working in agriculture. We have gender violence, we have uh, even the conflict do before uh, before the law on uh, access to land, the land tenure. So now we are still fighting as we make the regulations, as we make the laws, as we make the guidance. We are improving very well in human capacity in the development of uh, agriculture. So without taking a lot of time. I thank you so much for being with you and the wish this event will be fruitful and happy to, to know that we will launch the, the hand to empower agriculture investment in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruha Kana, for your comments and your contributions. I am actually looking at the little thumbnails across the top of my screen, and I'm watching everybody watching you, Mr. Ruakana, and all of the speakers, and everybody is focused and very attentive. This next part of our program, I know you will all be leaning in. This part of our program 
it's particularly exciting. We have been talking about the handbook, the potential of the handbook, but have you had a presentation of the handbook? No, you have not. How do we do a deep dive in a few minutes? Ha! Ah, I have the two perfect people to do that for you. Emma McGee and also Jean Leonard Tuardi from FAO will do their presentation for you right now. Lean in. Thank you. Thank you, Femi, for your introduction. As we all know, responsible agricultural investment remains one of the most effective uh, strategies for reducing anger and poverty, and is crucial to uh, mitigate the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. To support parliamentarians and advisors in these challenges and challenging times, and through an incredibly enriching collaboration with uh, IISD, we have developed this practical handbook on responsible investment in agriculture and uh, food systems, which I'm very glad to present today. The handbook shows how parliamentarians with their democratic functions are uniquely positioned to enable a proper environment for responsible investments through policies, laws, monitoring mechanisms, and incentives. The handbook offers tools for action, outlines the kind of policy responses required, and gives types of how to ensure coherence participation, and sustainability. Finally, I would like to uh, emphasize that the S book is based on the main interest, and this is very important, shown in a survey conducted by FAO in 2019 and counted on the feedback of several members of parliament and parliamentary advisor from different regions, including Africa. We were glad to see the enthusiastic participation of more than 25 MPs and advisors who share their perspectives, knowledge, and experience during the drafting process. Today, and on behalf of FAO, thank you again for making this possible and for joining us in this common goal a world free from anger and poverty. I would like now, with your permission, Femi, to give the floor to my colleague, Ima McGee, who is the lead author of the valuable publication and will provide an overview and its sections and content. Thank you again, and Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, I will try my best. I know I have two minutes to tell you uh, what is in the handbook and why you should go and check it out. First of all, let me tell you that in addition to the PDF publication that most of you will have seen and that you will find in the chat box there, we have put together a mobile responsive version, which you can consult from everywhere you are on your smartphone. Uh, I'd like to very quickly give you an overview of this tool. Uh, you should be able to see my screen right now. Um, I think you're seeing it. I hope you're seeing it. If not, let me know, please. Um, something very uh, useful, or at least we hope you'll find it useful, is that we have um, distinguished two uh, paths for this handbook uh, to um, make it 
um, useful for you. So for parliamentarians who are very short on time, you can access a short version with the must know information. And then there is a longer version with uh, more detailed information for the advisors and uh, you can check it online. Uh, very briefly, what is in this handbook? So first of all, uh, you will find in the uh, part one, uh, what is responsible investment? Um, and especially, uh, more importantly, how it can uh, achieve sustainable development goals. And we've put together a series of concrete um, guidance notes with indications of what you as parliamentarians, as advisors can do uh, at country level. First of all, how to assess your national policy, legislative and institutional frameworks for responsible investments. And you will see here, uh, there are a series of steps that you can follow. Uh, and also there are a series of very uh, concrete questions that you can look at uh, when you're doing this kind of evaluation. There are other uh, guidance notes that you will find here. How to ensure consistency in the legal and policy framework to promote responsible investment. Uh, how to advocate to reform existing laws or adopt new laws in the case that your assessment tells you that's what you need to do. Uh, very important, how to ensure uh, adequate financing for the implementation of such laws. Uh, and fifth, uh, very important, how to ensure effective parliamentary oversight to monitor implementation of laws that are related to responsible investment. Uh, I know we're very short on time, so I won't go into a lot of details, but I do encourage you to check out the uh, third part of this handbook where you will see uh, useful data that will make your uh, work uh, easier. So where can you find the data? Uh, what kind of indicators you can uh, use and where you can find them? And also some very, um, specific key messages that you can use when you're communicating to your target audiences. So when you're meeting with your uh, par parliament counterparts, when you're meeting with the private sector, uh, when you're meeting with the civil society and many others. Um, do also check out the annexes. Uh, you will find um, very interesting uh, in the annex two, a compilation of existing legislation that promotes responsible investment in agriculture in different countries. You will also see in the uh, Annex uh, 3 some key studies of real investments in agriculture and food systems from different countries and different regions that uh, not only show that it is possible to invest responsibly, but indicate what kind of results and impact you can obtain and also how this contributes to sustainable development. So I do hope you find this useful. Uh, I do remain at disposal uh, for any question and comment. And just let me thank all those who have contributed to this handbook. Uh, there is a lot of experts behind from FAO, IISD, but uh, especially a, a lot of members of the parliament and advisors that have shared with us their knowledge. So thanks again. And thanks, Bimi. Thank you for that joint presentation, Emma McGee and Jean Yena Tuadi from FAO. I am looking in the chat section and already the document Responsible Investments in Agriculture and Food Systems, a practical guide for parliamentarians and parliamentary advisors. The link is right there.
you can download the link even as I speak. I know new attendees are, are, are joining us. At the little base of the screen, you'll see a little globe there, and that indicates if you would like to hear this presentation either in English or in French, that's exactly where you can hear the interpretation and the etiquette for our, for our, our uh, virtual uh, event and our virtual handbook launch is microphones off unless you are speaking. Let us move on because I, I know what you're thinking. You are thinking, so how are we even going to use this handbook? We thought about this as we put this program together. The Honorable Jean Kuka is from the National Assembly of Congo. He reviewed the handbook for us. So uh, Honorable Jean Kuka, we would love to know in the context of your country, what do you find useful? What do you think you would be able to make the most practical use of? Please go ahead, welcome. Merci pour la parole. Je voudrais d'emblée remercier les initiateurs de cette session, mais aussi remercier et saluer tous les panélistes. Pour aller droit au but, vous me demandez dans quelle mesure le guide peut être utilisé de manière pratique par l'Assemblée nationale congolaise pour renforcer les investissements responsables dans la culture. Ça, c'est la première question. À cette question, je voudrais dire que ce guide peut être utilisé comme un manuel d'inspiration et de procédures méthodologiques pour susciter les initiatives des parlementaires congolais dans le processus d'élaboration des lois visant à renforcer les investissements responsables dans l'agriculture et à mettre en œuvre les engagements pris dans les traités et contrats, ainsi que dans les instruments juridiques régionaux. Je voulais dire que ce guide peut aussi aider à l'élaboration des lois nationales pertinentes sur l'investissement dans l'agriculture et les systèmes alimentaires et à l'approbation du budget à l'adoption des politiques publiques conséquentes et afférentes, ainsi que à assurer un suivi de la mise en œuvre effective des lois et des engagements pris dans ces contrats et ces engagements internationaux. Quant à la question de savoir pourquoi Pouvez-vous indiquer les parties qui, selon vous, seront les plus utiles et nous dire pourquoi? Je veux simplement dire que l'ensemble du document est intéressant et très édifiant. Cependant, j'ai été marqué par la deuxième partie de ce guide portant sur les notes d'orientation spécifique et par les annexes 2 et 3 qui de manière didactique présentent des situations concrètes pouvant susciter les vocations en matière d'élaboration de ces lois. Voilà de manière succincte ce que je pourrais avoir comme réaction par rapport aux questions que vous nous avez posées, et simplement pour souligner que effectivement ce guide est intéressant et peut nous aider dans notre travail de parlementaire pour ce combat pour l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable, notamment la, la fin zéro. Et donc, pour nous, c'est un document important et nous sommes heureux 
que cette initiative soit, ait été prise et pour nous aider dans ce travail qui est important, surtout en cette période où la pandémie est venue aggraver les, les situations de malnutrition et de, de carence alimentaire. Voilà l'économie de mon intervention. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Honorable John Kuka from the National Assembly of Congo. We continue with how do you use this handbook? How will people use this handbook? How will it be practical? We move on to Dr. Mrs. Jahad Alfafer. She's the Deputy Chairwoman of the Parliamentary Network for Food Security in Africa and the Arab World. Good evening, everybody, uh, and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to participate in this meeting, uh, which uh, uh, addresses uh, a very important uh, and central issue. Um, uh, I believe uh, we cannot get any uh, kind of improvement uh, in this issue without uh, the cooperation uh, uh, with the many, many uh, different sectors uh, with with the, with government uh, uh, and uh, with the private sector, with the civil society, um, uh, regarding uh, the, um, the the role of the uh, legislative institution, it is uh, its duty uh, to issue attractive legislation to encourage agricultural investment, because uh, these uh, legislations are the key to the sustainability of investments and uh, their experts. Um, it is important for parliaments um, to work on uh, localiz locali localizing um, industries related to agriculture, uh, especially the uh, machinery and the technology used in agricultural projects because um, the cost of uh, pro uh, production and uh, import uh, depletes uh, huge sums of money um it's uh, it is also the localization of uh, industries should be done by approving financial funds uh, for these huge projects or approving uh, borrowing laws in this regard uh, parliamentarians should also uh, seriously think about adopting a model law that uh, guides the promotion of investment in the agricultural field it is possible to benefit uh, from the efforts of the uh, Parliamentary Network for Food Security and the FAO in this field. Um, the law uh, must take uh, into account the provision of customs facilities between countries for uh, importing and exporting uh, attention to uh, environmental, environmental uh, standards and attention to the safe application of labor laws and the uh, prohibition of uh, child labor. Uh, now regarding uh, the role of government, it is important uh, for parliament to cooperate with the government uh, to increase support uh, for new or small investors uh, in the agricultural field, especially the youth. Uh, who uh, should be more uh, involved with facilities and incentives that contribute to achieving sustainable agricultural production in youth hands uh, in order to uh, invest modern technologies and getting to know more uh, accurately uh, population needs. Uh, I think the handbook uh, should be part uh, of the parliamentarians' uh, work uh, by proposing uh, legislative uh, drafts uh, or using uh, uh, government uh, accountability tools in order to bridge the gaps uh, in law. Um, we're all uh, aware of uh, the main duty uh, of uh, Parliament, which is to legislate and uh, monitor. Uh, the guidance uh, of the handbook uh, will help us uh, to fill legislative gaps uh, with the laws in force or uh, to propose um, uh, lower drafts uh, that contribute to the sustainability of agricultural invest investment. Uh, investment, as we know, requires uh, achieving more security 
uh, and uh, stability in the country, which means the necessity of extending the rule of law, uh, imposing security and adopting transparency as an approach in running the state. And these rules uh, require that the eye of parliamentary oversight be present on the performance of the government in charge of achieving security and protecting investment of all kinds. Uh, I wish, uh, honestly, to launch uh, this uh, useful and practical handbook in the uh, Arab, uh, Arab countries uh, as well. And thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. And Mrs. Jihad al Fafel. Uh, really appreciate having you being part of our launch program today. Uh, the Honorable Kony Dongyon is a member of the Pan-African Parliament. He's very, very experienced. He helped write and review this handbook. He knows it in detail. I don't want him to go through for you how he did it, but I do want him to bring some personal reflections on what did you learn? Honorable Kony Dongyon, member of Pan-African Parliament. Lessons learned, personal lessons learned. Welcome. Merci beaucoup, Femi. Merci beaucoup. Merci à l'ISD. Merci à, à la FAO qui nous a associés. Euh, J'avoue que ça a été très enrichissant et très excitant d'avoir participé à la réalisation de ce document. Oh, combien! important pour euh, euh, l'atteinte de, des objectifs de lutte contre euh, la pauvreté, de lutte contre euh, la faim. Un, ça nous donne un aperçu euh, sur le rôle des parlementaires euh, dans la mise en place d'environnement favorable euh, dans les investissements, dans l'agriculture et les systèmes euh, évidemment euh, alimentaires. Nous apprécions surtout euh, euh, les notes, les différentes notes d'orientation qu'il y a dans, dans le guide, ainsi que les exemples de législation. Et nous espérons que ce document va euh, inspirer, va servir de guide réellement aux différents euh, parlementaires pour euh, écrire de bonnes législations, pour euh, lutter contre la faim et pour euh, améliorer, pour renforcer la, la nutrition. Euh, tout à l'heure, le représentant de la FAO a dit que euh, il a parlé euh, de la loi, que, de la loi type que le Parlement panafricain vient de faire. Je voudrais remercier justement la FAO, qui a été notre partenaire euh, principal dans l'élaboration de, 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 de cette loi. Mais évidemment, ce n'est pas l'objet euh, du jour, donc on ne va pas s'étendre là-dessus. Mais je voudrais remercier euh, l'Institut international de développement durable et la FAO pour euh, le soutien qu'ils apportent au Parlement panafricain depuis bientôt euh, 10 ans. Thank you very much. Do you remember a little bit earlier on in our program when Emma McGee and uh, Jean-Lionel Touadi, they were, they were doing a presentation of the handbook, the handbook that they have slaved and worked over, and they had a few minutes. And I just wanted to return to both of them to get their, their takeaway really for the process of making this work? The highlights and the lowlights. Emma, <laughs> come back into the conversation. Can you believe you're actually on launch day now? It is done. The work is done. This is fantastic. Let's start with a low light. Be honest, be candid. What was the worst moment of making this handbook work? Um, I. I have to say, probably the, the question is the same to the low and the high, which was precisely the involvement of the members of the parliament. So we, we all know how uh, busy they are in their um, everyday work, but we really wanted to have them on board. We didn't want to come with a finished product for them to, to, to read at some point. We really wanted them to be involved. So we uh, translated the draft into French and Spanish at the same time. And this was circulated over the summer in Africa, Latin America, 
um, and Asia for comments. So it was really hard to put together the views from different countries um, and to, to make sure we were just producing something useful. Uh, but at the same time, I think that's the rich part of it. So it, it of course, it, it, it is a global product. So of course, every country will have to adapt it to its own needs um, and also see how the legislation works at country level. Uh, but uh, I think that thanks to all these contributions, it is a product that can be uh, really used whether you're in the north of Africa, in the south, or even uh, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. What did you leave out and you just thought, ah, oh, I wish I could have left this in, but I can't put every single detail in. What did you leave out? The answer is probably nothing. <laughs> you don't <laughs> want to tell, you don't want to tell the parliamentarians that there's anything that's not juicy that's not in there. But but what did you what did you think? Oh, maybe it has to be an addition to or maybe a different publication. What what did you struggle? Because you can't put all of your knowledge into into the handbook. Yeah, well, we really tried to think what of FAO and the IASD knowledge would be the most useful for who would use the handbook. So we um, try not to explain everything, but just go to the point. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in the mobile version that I have shown earlier, uh, there are specific links that people can click on if there is one particular topic they would like to know more on that we, we couldn't explain in detail. So there, there should be other information in case they're interested and it, it was tough because we the the main review that we kept getting was you need to shorten this uh, it has to be a short product and then mm -hmm. at the same time people were saying why don't you speak about this or why don't you add this other topic so uh, that was <laughs> this be shorter, but put this chapter in. Ah, oh, that's that's so tricky. I mean, but you but you are smiling now, so I I can tell that this is a good place for you to be right now. You're yeah, it, it's it, yeah. it's it's impressive, and I'm really thankful for all these uh, really exceptional speakers to be here today and speak about responsible investment in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's it's really yeah. impressive. I can hear the sincerity as well from all, all, all of the presentations and the comments, et cetera. Uh, Emma McGee from Val, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you. I, I, I want to bring in here Francoise Owemukazi from ELA, E-A-L-A. Uh, uh, Francoise, we, we have two minutes. So your uh, comment will be two minutes long. Please go ahead and take the floor. Let me, let me go back uh, to Jean Leonard Tohadi. Uh, Jean, you, you did this very speedy presentation with Emma McGee from FAL, and, and your takeaway from listening to the speakers today, from listening to their appreciation, from how they're going to apply the handbook, what is your takeaway? Uh, Jean Leonard Tohadi, please unmute yourself and, and uh, share your takeaway with us. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Uh, I would like, first of all, I thank all the MPs present here, not only uh, for being uh, present at this, at this lunch, but for having contributed uh, to uh, the drafting of uh, the handbook, as uh, uh, Emma was saying first. It is very important for FAO to more and more involve parliamentarians in uh, uh, the definition of the priorities of uh, our common agenda, because we are talking about common challenges and common agenda that has to be addressed by all the stakeholders. And it, 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 it is more and more important for FAO uh, to involve uh, parliamentarians, their networks and their advisor. Because Femi, at the end of the day, you may have a very interesting project uh, set up by a government, uh, set up by public institutions. But if you don't have permanent laws, if you don't have uh, frameworks of laws uh, giving uh, really uh, priorities and infrastructures to people in order to implement uh, what we call uh, 
basic needs for people. You may know that basic needs are basic rights. So when we talk about uh, responsible investment in agriculture, we are talking about mm -hmm. giving people um, the opportunity to have their basic, their basic needs, access to basic needs. Let me, let me ask you. I, I, me I would like really to, to stress yeah. their role. Uh, the role of parliamentarians. Let me ask you one, one, one final thought, and we're going to wrap it up. So it's a thirty-second response on Leonardo Duardi, and, and that is. Uh, it is obvious that there was a lot of collaboration happening, not just with the parliamentarians and their teams, but in order to bring this handbook together, there were many different organizations all involved in that. Why is that important? And you can also uh, wrap us up with the thank yous that you would like to do to all of those various different stakeholders that made this handbook possible. In 30 seconds, I'm impressed if you can do it. Yes, yes. One of the uh, characteristics of globalization is, and I, I really like to stress it, interconnection, interrelation. Uh, if really uh, the challenges are global, no one may, uh, may be able to uh, address these challenges alone. It's why we really need to be interconnected, to be uh, to ensure that everyone has something to do, everyone has something to bring uh, to what is our dream, a dream where no one will, uh, will remain behind. This is really uh, the, the, the word and the slogan we are working for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And thank you all of the attendees. We really appreciate you. Uh, if you look in the chat section, there are so many links that you will find useful to take away. This actual recording will be available in French and also in English. The handbook is available again in the chat to be downloaded. I thank you for your attention. Uh, for me, an hour and a half session with, with intense concentration I am impressed that all of you are doing this, but this is because you are parliamentarians or teams of parliamentarians and you are used to sessions where people are giving you information and you're speaking, you're paying attention. I salute you and thank you very much. I hope you find the handbook. Uh, may I say something before you leave? And helpful. We are wrapping up, but if you can say it in one sentence, that yeah. would be beautiful. And it's yeah, good to I hear your voice so. right yeah. at the end. Surprise I think, I think it is an opportunity for Ayala to, to be heard because I got a technical issue at the last minute when I was recorded to talk. It was really unfortunate. Uh, but distinguished guests, uh, fellow uh, parliamentarians, hello everyone. On behalf of Ayala, allow me to present a summary of what MPs have been doing so far to support a responsible investment in agriculture and food security. Uh, you know, at the EAC level, we have already got a, a Department of Agriculture and Food Security. And this with the impressive agriculture and food security programs. Uh, you know that at EAC level, uh, we have a livelihood of citizens in East Africa, uh, which is uh, predominantly dependent on agriculture. And also the sector accounts for 25 a percent up to 40 percent of of EA, EAC partner states. Uh, this is Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and the Republic of South Sudan uh, gross domestic product. And this is really very a leading employer for over 80 percent of the population in the region. And more than 70 percent of the industries in the EAC are agro-based and depend on agriculture as the main source of raw materials. Agricultural commodities constitute about 65% of the volume of intra-region trade in the EAC. So as members of EYALA, EYALA is East African Legislative Assembly. Uh, we, had, we have been doing uh, so tough to make sure uh, we have our role in the, the contribution of responsible investment in agriculture, uh, such as uh, we, are, we are influencing the, the, the budgetary enhancement in the agricultural sector. Uh, we did it last year, but we continue to do it. And also we have done an oversight activity on the impact of COVID-19 on food and security in the region. And also we attend IPU, Interparliamentary Union, every year. Uh, and the meetings uh, help us to, 
to, to cooperate, to cooperate in the sustainable development goals. And uh, we also, we are good stakeholders of IISD and FAO. And also as MPs, we support the responsible investment in agriculture by influencing the budget, uh, given that uh, the assembly is the, the ESC organ that is scrutinized and approve the, the budget, of course, in agreement with the Council of Ministers and the, the entire community. We influence the budget whereby we make sure at least the Malabo declaration commitments by head of state uh, are honored uh, through the budget. And as far as registration is con concerned, we also uh, move uh, tremendous motions to make sure climate change, for instance, livestock domain is assured and also land. And uh, we support also some programs at EAC level, uh, such as EAC flagship programs in the agricultural sector uh, that are interrelated and in interdependent as follows, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, a comprehensive Africa agricultural development program, CADAP, food and security, uh, and farm inputs, promoting youth employment in agriculture, and also livestock development. Uh, I thank you very much, and you may liaise uh, in the future to continue to, to chat and to interact because you are in touch already with the FAO and the IICD. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that we managed to resolve our technology challenges there. We are going to end as we began with Abibi Ali Gabriel, Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa, FAO, and then closing up our entire virtual handbook launch, Richard Florizone from IISD, the CEO of IISD. Gentlemen. Femi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, an excellent facilitation. It's, it's a pleasure to, to see you and listen to you, as always. Um, I wouldn't take a lot of time. Uh, one message is that uh, we have all taken very useful lessons from our experiences in the past. Remember the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, CADEP, it was adopted in 2003. And one of the commitments that the heads of, uh, the heads of state and government made was to allocate at least 10% of their national budget to agriculture. Now, 17 years later, if you look at the progress uh, countries have made, you will be disappointed. And one of the lessons was that, you know, budgets are approved by the parliaments and parliamentarians play a key role in oversight functions in terms of ensuring accountability for those commitments. But they have been left out in the formulation of those declarations in, 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 and also in uh, really advocating for their, for, for their support. I'm very glad to see that a lot of parliamentarians have, are, are now uh, really playing an increasingly important role. And this is a lesson. We should not leave you out. We should not have left you out of this equation. You are very, very important. Second is formulation of an excellent framework or declaration is just one thing. Unless we implement it on the ground, unless we make use of it, the whole exercise, the whole investment is going to be useless. And without uh, uh, domestication, really into national policies, national action plans, and this is not going to take us any, anywhere. And parliamentarians are significant stakeholders. They should be taking lead role in this. So I just want to say that uh, it's one way of reconfirming uh, uh, our commitment, FAO's commitment to continue to work with parliamentarians among other significant uh, stakeholders in this. So thank you so much for your active participation and we will continue to do more of the same. Thank you. Over to you. Richard Flores, and we are waiting for your brilliant closing remarks. Look, I wanna, I wanna well, on that note, Femi, thanks so much. And I wanna end where we began, which is uh, to thank everyone, thank the FAO, thank ISD, thank the parliamentarians for taking part in this. We all know the challenge. Um, we know increased investment is needed. But we also know uh, that it's the right kind of investment that's needed. So it's my sincere hope that this uh, practical handbook that we define together will give us a path forward. Now the challenge for us is to make it real. 
uh, to implement it in, in parliaments, in laws and regulations, in countries throughout Africa. Um, at ISD, we sincerely look forward to working with all of you uh, to make that happen. Uh, thank you again, uh, Femi. Thank you to the organizers. And thank you again to everyone who took part today in this important milestone. Now let's make it a success. Let's work together. Thank you all very much. This session is now closed. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.